President here at Palo de Marin, and on behalf of uh, President David Wayne Coon, who is traveling today, as well as the faculty, staff, and all the students at the college, welcome to the James Dunn Theater at the Kentfield campus. We are very happy to have you here. I will say it's a little, uh, hopefully my brief remarks uh, don't correlate to your sleep and aging. Uh, <laughs> you do not want to get this off on the wrong foot. Um, I have a question for you. How many of you uh, have been to the college before? Excellent, that's wonderful. How many of you have taken a class, whether credit, non-credit, or community education? Wow. Excellent, wow. this is wonderful. Well, welcome back. Um, we're glad that you, to see you back on campus. On Monday, we will have nearly 6,000 students across our credit, non-credit, and community education courses uh, on campus as we start the spring semester. Uh, it's always nice to have students back, and this is a great trial run for us to make sure that things are working okay. <laughs> Thank you for uh, your patience this morning. As you probably hunted for parking, you probably noticed that we are in the midst of installing a major solar project in our parking lots. Uh, that will, at this campus, when completed, save over 30% uh, of our uh, um, uh, utility usage. Uh, we have a similar project at the Indian Valley campus that will save 87% of our electricity usage. So, um, we're very excited to be able to host uh, and to, to sponsor Mini Medical School. Uh, it's a wonderful program. Uh, anytime we can get people together uh, around a common interest and talk about important subjects, we want to do that. Uh, and I certainly want to thank you for taking the time to come here today. And hopefully you will also be back next week uh, and we will see you there as well. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dean, our Dean of uh, Health Sciences, Marshall Alameda, who has a few housekeeping items, uh, I want to uh, recognize our uh, trustees who are in the room today. And before I do that, I also want to give a big thank you, and let's give a round of applause to all of the staff uh, and students and others who have worked hard to put this program together. So with us today, I know we have uh, trustee uh, Phil Cranenberg, Stuart Tannenberg, <laughs> Trustee Greg Levis, and I know that uh, Trustees Diana Conti, Wandine Trainer, and Stephanie O'Brien want to be wanted to be here, but had other commitments, and I believe they plan on coming next week. And of course, our current president of the board and the mastermind behind the Mini Medical School. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eva Long. certainly not to the, to the level it has. This is our third time around. It's our largest uh, uh, crowd, uh, and we're very excited and thankful for Eva's hard work and visionary um, uh, thinking putting this uh, together. In fact, some of you probably, many of you probably received personal invitations from Eva along the way. So with that, uh, again, thank you. We're happy to have you here on this sunny Saturday morning, uh, and I look forward to seeing you around campus, uh, apparently, since you all are students here on an ongoing basis, on a regular basis. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Marshall Alameda. Obviously, I look up to uh, John Eldridge in more ways than one. So again, my welcome to you as well. A few logistical issues uh, to point out uh, for your benefit. We have six exits in the auditorium. You can see one on either side here. Uh, you can see four in the back of the auditorium, across the auditorium. In terms of restrooms, back in the lobby, in this corner over here, there are two gender neutral bathrooms. Outside, directly outside of the uh, environment here, male restroom on the right, my right, female restroom, uh, restroom on the left. If you take the stairs down, uh, that are adjacent to those restrooms, you'll find, again, another set of uh, restrooms. And there's also an elevator directly uh, uh, outside uh, of the auditorium. If at any point in time you need any help or assistance with anything, please let any of us know. Dr. Merdad Ayati is an adjunct 
Assistant Professor of Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine, a physician, author, and educator. He is well known both nationally and internationally in the field of geriatric medicine. Changes of our sleep as we age immediately captured my interest, especially when it was put in one of the contexts of being a public health problem. This cued me to realize I really needed to know more about this topic. So please, give it up for Dr. Ayati. Dalai Lama always says the 
sleep is the best meditation, which is absolutely right. And the other one, which one of my students actually shared with me, sleeping is my drug, my bed is my dealer, and my alarm clock is the police. <laughs> There's some opinion, but you probably have opinion. What I want to introduce right now, the biggest lie in the history of human, and that was coming from Benjamin Franklin. Early to bed, early to rise, makes them unhealthy, wealthy, and wise. We know, based on neuroscience, this is the big lie. That's not true. <laughs> Actually, but before, the sleep was a sign of laziness. I mean, everybody said, well, if the people that sleep more, they actually have to help with this. Um, the, and, but now we know that people actually sleep more. They're more smart, and they actually think, and I'll tell you why. Now, there are some questions here. Do you agree that the sleep is an important part of the life? And it still is a mystery. I'm telling you today, as of 2018, I remember when I was in medical school, the chapter of the sleep was only five pages in, in Harrison and General Medicine book. But now the sleep became a science, and we have we, we discuss a lot about the sleep these days. And again, one third of our life we spend on sleep. If you leave based on longevity that we calculate today, nine years, nine years today, which is easily we can make it. Uh, 33 years of your life you actually spend on sleep. And in 60 years, you're awake. That's this very important point. And the other thing is, there are some change of the sleep by age. There are some of this absolutely is true, and I'm telling you why. 40% of people when they're aging, they have a problem with falling asleep. Um, they definitely have some uh, awakening more at night time. Early morning awakening, which is one of the things that you're probably going to ask me why, which I'll tell you why, that we actually um, wake up earlier when we actually getting older. Not in everyone, but in some of them. And the daytime is sleepiness and tendency to get more nap during the day. And again, a lot of other things that many of us, we actually take a lot of medication to help with the sleep issue, which I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Definitely, there is some physiology change. The sleep efficiency that, that we really calculate the time that actually is sleep divided by the time we actually are going to be in bed. Um, total sleep time may be stable as we age, maybe a little bit less, uh, but definitely we have some issues with falling to sleep and daytime napping, which I told you, and again, definitely change of brain, brain circadian rhythm, which is a discussion about that we will talk about. Now, the sleep by definition is that based on dictionary is that uh, when, when our body actually starts to get rest, where our body function voluntarily go to some the, the, the motion that is not going to be active. And this is, can be partial. This is so important to know. Because what happens is that our sensory system is kind of like a little bit partially is going to be inactive. You're still able to hear the noise if somebody, if something happened outside and your eyes, even is closed, it still can be active if there's going to be a bright light in the, in the room. But definitely what happens is that our volunteer muscle, the muscles that we, for example, be feeding ourselves or be using our hand to do something, is going to be for a temporary time, is not going to be active. But what, what happened to, to, to this situation? Now, I wanted to first, uh, if anyone knows this gentleman, and probably you here, this is Dr. William Depp. He's the father of the sleep medicine. He's actually a professor of the Stanford. He's the one actually made all this science about a stage of the sleep and, 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 and the different things about the sleep that we know today. And again, based on what he actually wrote, and there was actually a movie that the sleep walk with me was actually a very nice movie based on what he wrote about sleep, and it's still very active. Like just listening to him recently on NPR, when he was talking about sleep physiology, the time that he just started uh, the discussion about the sleep cycle. Now, let's just go a little bit to modern physiology, and I wanted to tell you what happened when we say we have the sleep cycle. Now, as you see here, we have two sleep cycles, and you probably hear that. Non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement. There is going to be two cycles. Now, what happened to us, like for example, tonight at 10 p.m., you want to go to the bed. Look at here. First, what happened, you're going to go to the light sleep. The first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and some people maybe a little bit more, but you're still active. If somebody texts you, you can, you can be awake. You're just going to be know what's going on. And then you go to a stage two and three, which is actually going to be non-rapid eye movement. It's a very, very deep sleep. It's a deep sleep, and if you have any dreams during these stages, you're not going to remember tomorrow. It's the best deep sleep time of your life. 
And then this, and then after that one cycle, which is usually takes around like you go from 30 minutes there, you go to the phase of the rapid eye movement of sleep, which you have, if somebody have a camera or if somebody look at your eyes, your eyes is closed, but it's moving so fast. Your heart rate is fast, you have elevated respiratory rate, you have a high rate of physiology, which I'm telling you why, and why this is important, and we didn't know about that. And you finish the one cycle. Means you started the journey at 11 p.m., around 90 to 110 minutes, but for example, probably around 12.30, you're done with the first cycle. Now, there's a thing. Some people are very lucky. They go from one cycle to another cycle without any pause. They're not going to be awake. Some people, after they finish first cycle, they're going to be awake. They need to go to the bathroom, come back. And they want to go to first the state, another cycle, they have a hard time to go to the next cycle. Now what happened is, in the, in the beginning of the night, think about it, sleeping all in the night. We're all living in the West Coast. We're not, we're not living in places that there's uh, again, different time, daytime. If, if, if usually during the sleep cycle, or deep sleep, it's more at the beginning of the night. Toward the morning, we actually sleep more in the REM sleep. No, in the REM sleep, whatever you have a dream, you're able to remember it next morning. That's why you wake up and say, I had a very strange dream last night. That was in your REM sleep. Now I'm telling you why this is important, that you actually remember that. Now in the deep sleep, which are children, especially infant, babies, toddler, they actually have a very, very sound deep sleep. I sometimes jealous to my son when he's in the deep sleep. Oh my God, this is such a nice sleep that he But they, 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 usually they are in this, this phase of the sleep, and this is the way. And now, when we talk about uh, the sleep, deep sleep, this is last time you remember. You've been awake for a long time, and you suddenly go and fall asleep. You even don't want to change your clothes. You just want to find a place. This is exactly stage two and three of the sleep, which is very, very deep sleep and non rapid eye movement of sleep. And um, it's very restful. It's uh, definitely your prefrontal vascular tone, and, and, and many other things are going to be slow. Your heart rate is going to be very slow at that time. Your brain try to kind of like go in the low phase because it start to, to kind of recover. And this is, this is actually a very important part. And then again, our metabolic rate also is going to be dropped during our sleep, deepest sleep stages to stage two and three. But when we talk about REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement, which is kind of like this coronized sleep time, our body is actually uh, going to be a little different. In the normal time, uh, REM sleep lasts between 5 to 30 minutes, an average of every, every 90 minutes that we have a phase. Now, when we are having the day that will be very restful at that day, our REM sleep is going to be longer, or deeper sleep is going to be shorter. The day when we're very exhausted, our REM sleep is going to be shorter, and our, our deeper sleep is going to be longer. REM sleep is the phase that you wake up in the morning. Some people, they, sometimes they come and say, when I wake up in the morning, I feel anxious. I feel my heart rate is still fast. I don't feel well when I wake up. The reason, because you wake up suddenly from REM sleep, your heart rate was fast, you're still anxious, you're dealing with the dreams that you are having in the brain, and you suddenly wake up to the reality and say, hey, another day, you have to go to the work, you have to do something. And this is the reason that we, we feel like sometimes headache or anxious at that time. REM sleep is important, and one of the things is that we have all the dreams, and it's very interesting because if somebody put the camera in your room, you see during the REM sleep, you actually have a lot of body movement. You're tossing, turning in the bed, you go that way and that way, and there is a, there, there is a reason I'm telling you why. And, and, and I told you when we have, uh, 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 when we have or, or, or again, um, we wake up in the morning with the REM sleep. But what, what things is important on the REM sleep? is that our muscles, even we have some movement in the bed, it should be paralyzed. If, do, if it doesn't paralyze, what happened? You're gonna act in all your dreams as sleep. This is the reason people get sleepwalking. Because if people get sleepwalking, they're right asleep, they're supposed to get paralyzed, but they wake up and they start to, when their eyes are closed, they go that way. Because they're following the dreams that they have. Now, if, if you don't have, uh, the paralyzed phase on that, then this is exactly what happened. A lot of people, they have REM behavioral sleep disorder. I don't know if you hear that or not. 
But think about this, this, this thing, I, I see a lot. People get Parkinson's disease, the people get kind of like dementia, we call Lewy body dementia. They have rheumatoid behavioral disorder. The first thing I hear as a complaint, the wife or husband's come and say, we had a fight in the bed. It's, it's, and the reason is because that partner having the dreams about boxing or something or calling someone and it start to punching the partner. And that was the reason that the vets didn't get separated at first, number one. But this is the REM behavioral sleep disorder, one of the very, very actually important. Because again, uh, uh, we, we actually have, and if we don't get paralyzed, we actually gonna have all, uh, all of our acting up our dreams every night, which is happening. Now, the biggest question, the big question here is what happened to the brain? Why were heart rate supposed to be fast? Or respiratory rate supposed to be fast? Why? Why do we need to have a brain REM sleep? I mean, well, why we don't have all this slow wave of sleep and deep sleep all the night? There is a reason. And this is the reason it's so important to know. Our brain is very active during the REM sleep. If you do PET scan, you will see the number of the red colors actually is going to be higher during the REM sleep, which means the brain is super active. And this, is, this, is, this was a big mystery of all neuroscience. Why? Why do we need to be our brain being active, which I told you why? Brain metabolism is actually increased 20% during the REM sleep, and this is exactly going to come to this question: Why do we need to sleep? If the brain is not sleeping, why is actually going to sleep phases? What happened to us if we don't sleep, and what happened to us if we don't have this increase in metabolism of the REM sleep? I will tell you with sharing the story. You have probably shared the story before, but do you know this gentleman? is a very famous guy. Uh, he's Randy Garner. He was a college student in San Diego, and, um, and he actually had a very interesting thing happen. He had a record of not sleeping for 264 and 24 hours, which is 11 days and, and 24 minutes. And it's very interesting, because recently I was just reading a Stanford News about Dr. Devon when they actually had this volunteer. Um, that's, and, and what happened is that they're not using any stimulants, no coffee, nothing, and it would happen in 1964. I was actually listening to one of his interviews, I think he's around uh, middle age right now, and he was, he was talking to CNN about his experience. After him, another person in South Africa actually broke the record to a little bit more, 11 days and some more hours. But again, this is the situation. And what happened is that they did all this um, electroacid hologram, they check the blood pressure, they check the EKG, and they monitor this gentleman to see what happened to this guy if he doesn't sleep for 11 days. Now, you can tell about yourself, but let me share about the story of Randy. <coughs> what happened to Randy, it was very interesting. Second day, his eyes stopped focusing. They brought some papers in front of him. He was not able to see them very well. He stopped identifying the object with touch. He was not able to say, this is hard, this is soft. And on day three, he started to become very moody, he become uncoordinated, his mood started to change, he started to hallucination to the day of five and six, he started to have short-term memory loss, which I'm telling you a little bit more about that. And then he started to become paranoid, and then after 11 days, he said, forget about it, stop. His blood pressure went high, and I said, okay, well, he's gonna die, just to stop it. And then they let him to sleep. He finally recovered, he's healthy now. But experience of Randy, told us that there is definitely an important thing happen to the brain that only we need the sleep time in order to coordinate all of the stuff which I'm telling you in, in this discussion. If I wanted to tell you about that, I need to talk to you about two important, uh, again, alarming things in your body that you probably hear that. One of them is very famous, melatonin. Everybody knows about that. But I want to talk to you about animism because then I'm able to answer you the question I brought it up earlier. There are the signals that it goes to our system and then makes your brain to sleep. Now I will tell you first about adenosine. <laughs> adenosine is a product of protein. It's built through the body and is built up through the body and it goes to the brain. It's actually a product of muscles and it's so important because what we say about ATP, which means that we use the energy when we're using our muscles and we actually build we, we actually burn more ATP, and then be able to burn more um, adenosine. And adenosine, it goes up during the day in your brain, and when the adenosine is going to be very high to your brain, 
This is the time you feel this deep pressure. I mean, you wanted to really open your eyes, but you go this. And that means your atomism is very high to the brain. You build up a lot of atomism. Um, I'm, I'm sure with my boring lecture also you have the same feeling. But uh, my atomism is the time that it goes and build up, build up, build up. Now, what can block the atomism? You have it this morning. Coffee. That's why everybody was rushing to get some coffee. <laughs> coffee is exactly doing this thing. Coffee and caffeine goes to the receptors to the brain and blocking animals in to go to the to, to, to affect it on the brain. That's why coffee gives you some relief. That's why coffee is stimulants. Coffee is what will make wake you up. Tea or coffee, anything is stimulant that you drink. But this is exactly um, uh, the reason that the coffee can wake you up, but, but there is a limitation because there's going to be a time that the amount of atoms is going to be very high and then, then no matter how much coffee or high quality coffee you drink, you're still not able to fight and you, you finally end up with death. But I can answer you the big question here. Why exercise makes you to sleep? I told you, atomism is a product of muscle use. If you don't use your muscles, you don't produce atomism during the day. Now, one of the problems with your aging population, which is always we, we encourage them, is doing physical activity and exercise. And you understand why. This is not only for cardiovascular health, this is not for diabetes, this is not for joint. Because as we do more, especially if you do more strenuous exercise, resistance exercise, which is very important, then you're able to build more atoms in your every day, and that can be your ambient at night. Because atoms are going to go up, you're able to, to, to go and fall asleep much easier. And this is the reason that if you, if you, if you exercise more, you're able to sleep more. Now what happened to the sleep? This is amazing things happen to our physiology. There is a system we call the glymphatic system. The lymphatic system is produced by the spine. We have a fluid in there, goes all the way to the brain. There's a circulation in the brain. During the sleep is the only time you're able to clean all the atoms in from your system. And this is, comes to, to this picture. This is actually going to be the time that you clean all the atoms in from your brain system and you're able to wake up next day fresh. If you're not able to sleep, then you still have atoms in from the day before. This is why, if you don't sleep on the, some days on the road, you're actually going to have a problem with your cognition because you build a lot of atoms in your brain and you're able, not able to clean them. So quickly on the next signal is melatonin. And everybody loves to know about melatonin. <coughs> melatonin is important. It's a, it's a brain circadian rhythm. This is different mechanism than atomism. It's a brain master clock. It's something that responds to the light and it's in all the things, animals, plants, microbes, everything they have. And then melatonin has a very important job. Melatonin is, is every day going to the, all the organs and say, knock the door, that's the night, this is sleep time. It's your brain clock, it's melatonin. Now, this is important to know because I'm going to tell you why. This is exactly what I talk about circadian rhythm. I will tell you how we produce melatonin in this picture. Now, follow me here, it's a very easy picture. Um, here's the light, which, not this light. This light is not going to make you sleep, but if you go outside getting some light during the day, the light goes to your eyes, and from the lens, go to your retina. And what happens to the retina, you actually get the light, and send it to the place in the brain here, which we call suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a very interesting center because that processes the, the light that you get during the day. When it processes, it's sending to the place in the brain we call PUNS, P-O-N-S. This is the place that you produce natural melatonin and release into your blood circulation. And it goes to your system and help you to understand this is the day, this is the night. If you don't have this system, you don't understand it. No, I don't want to go with the next slide. I wanted to tell you some of the question, why as we age, we have some problem with the brain circadian and it's very easy. Number one, here, eyes, we get cataract. Our lens not going to be clear. We're not able to pass in the light clearly from outside to our retina. We get retinopathy, our retinas is not functioning very well. That's why we're not processing the light signal. And what the other things happen is a calcification of suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's why when we get the light, we're not able to process it naturally and send it to the pools and producing melatonin. 
This is one of the answer to the question, why as we age, we have more problem with the sleep? Because that physiology process is not going to function 100%. No. Then people don't have memory loss. I'm not saying memory loss, dementia. Dementia is a disease. Memory loss, I have memory loss. But now, dementia, this is getting worse. The reason is the people get dementia, like for example, somebody has Alzheimer's dementia, or somebody has a stroke, all this pass is going to be blocked. Amyloid protein is going to come and block it all this way. And that's the reason the dementia people not able to sleep. They don't understand day and night. There is no way you can have a dement very advanced dementia person sitting here and say, this is the day, this is the night. They don't know. And why they don't know? Even you show the light? Because the, the melatonin is not going to be produced there. Now, melatonin is a time messenger, as I told you, that actually goes to all the cells and tell them about the sleep. Now, this has happened to us. This is us. 24 hours of our life. Come with me, and I will tell you about the melatonin in this picture, which is actually very nice. Because this is 24 hours. And I wanted to start from here. I told you that melatonin during the day, we actually put, we, we get the light, and the melatonin goes up. And around 9 o'clock, melatonin is going to be start to come to the blood circulation from the light that you got during the daytime. This is 9 o'clock at the night, your melatonin is start to rise. And what happens, the first thing melatonin does, goes to your GI system and your bladder, gas from your intestine, and say, it's time to sleep. Don't go to the bathroom. We're done. If melatonin doesn't work, every night we're spending time in the bathroom, we'll have a ball movement. But because of melatonin, that's not going to happen. It waits till morning till you, to, you're going to wake up and then you're going to go to the bathroom. But then the other problem is that you can answer why some people have more urination at nighttime. And this can actually answer your question because they're not able to produce enough melatonin to go to the bladder and say, it's the sleeping time, please. I wanted to sleep. And, but that does not going to happen. Now, in the midnight, you have your deepest sleep, you're very happy, nothing happened, government is not shut down, and now all this stuff. Life is beautiful. And you sleep, and you get your deepest sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. You, everything is good, your melatonin is on the peak. But what happened is that melatonin, which I told you, which I tell you in the next slide, is going to be, and, and, and actually, whatever melatonin is going to be on the peak, your core body temperature is going to be down. This is the reason that if you have a blanket at night, you, you live it on your bed, four o'clock in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, you see you put your blanket on yourself, but you don't remember. What happened at three or four o'clock in the morning, you feel cold, and you're really looking for something to make you warm. And this is the time, because your core body temperatures drop. Now, six o'clock in the morning, you live in California, you wake up, light is on, and then you actually, and whenever the light is going to be up and melatonin is going to go down, you have the sharpest rise in your blood pressure. This is one of the advice, it's not related to that, but if, if I usually recommend to my patients, you want to check your blood pressure to see what is exactly the peak right after you wake up. This is the sharpest rise in your blood pressure. And then melatonin will start to stop around 7.30, and, but still, if you have some melatonin in your brain, you still feel a little bit drowsy. This is the reason that 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock, you have the highest accident in your heart rate. Because people are still drowsy. People are still sleepy. They don't have the full concentration. At 7 o'clock in the morning, everything is fine. 8 o'clock in the morning, the ball movement start. That's why the, the, there's going to be traffic in the bathroom in all the buildings. Because the, all the melatonin is suppressed. And the physiology come back. To, uh, and, and, and around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, you have the highest alertness. Not right now. I wish I was the second speaker. But you have the highest alertness at 10 or 11 o'clock. And then you're able to understand and process whatever you get. It. And this is the reason we never ask the kids to go have a quiz at 8 o'clock in the morning. We ask them to push it to 10 o'clock. And then you're fine. Afternoon, you have coordination is very good. You're able to concentrate on making a joke sometime. If you wanted to make an important financial decision, or if you wanted to break up with your partner, do it in the afternoon. Because you have the highest coordination at that time, not in the morning time. You may say something, but you're not going to be more focused. And then you have the highest cardiovascular capacity. This is the reason. Now, to answer another question, why do doctors recommend to do exercise in the afternoon? That's why. 
because you have the highest capacity of your cardiovascular system in the afternoon time and not in the morning time. Now, if somebody doing it in the morning, but I do because of my scheduling, I have to do it. But if, uh, if I'm able to do it in the afternoon, that's the best time of the exercise to do it. And then this, this, this cycle is going to go to storage. And then I go up it by evening time. This is the reason that actually your body temperature is going to go high in the afternoon time. This is the reason whenever we get flu or, or cold, we actually have more fever in the evening time because the body temperature is going to go high. This is us 24 hours of our life, and this is the circadian rhythm. We can answer a lot of these questions of what happened to us in the life of stuff like that. This is exactly what I told you. This is like, for example, at 9 o'clock at night, the pineal gland is starting to producing melatonin. It's going to be on the peak in the midnight, and it goes down in the morning time, which is going to be the next day stuff. Now, based on that, we have a problem that why do people have a different type of sleep? Advanced sleep phase disorder is for people that they are morning type people. They actually wake up between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning and they go to the bed between 6 to 9 p.m. Many of our aging population, they actually have a in this case. The middle age start toward the elderly. And as you see here, it's actually very clear. As you see here, their melatonin, instead of like going up around 9 o'clock, is actually go up around 6 p.m. You see that? And around like the peak will be around like 10 p.m. And it goes so down around like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And if you see their body temperature is actually in the, in the same way. And this is the this is important thing. This is, and I'll tell you why. Because the core body temperature drops in the evening time and we feel sleepy. And again, it's going to go up around like 2 or 4 o'clock in the morning and this is the time we actually wake up. And that's progress gradually. And this is the this is the answer to questions from a lot of my patients. Why I sleep earlier and I wake up at two o'clock and I can't fall asleep anymore. I cannot. And I, and I will tell you a little bit more about that. That this is always the debate I have with my patients about uh, sleeping medication. Because a lot of them they wake up at two o'clock, three o'clock, and they take the sleep medication at that time. It's the it's the worst thing that they can do for themselves. I will tell you why. Now, the, on the other side, some people, they have delayed the sleep phase disorder. They're actually, melatonin is going to go very late. Who are there? Teenagers. It's obvious. The actual teenagers, instead of melatonin go off at around 9 o'clock, it goes up after midnight, and they sleep all the way till 11 a.m. It's a very interesting, because a lot of time my, my, my friends, they have teenagers, and they say, oh, my, my, my son and my daughter is not sleeping, and this is, and say, this is their physiology, this is their brain. That's the way the melatonin sits, uh, cycle is actually going to go. And this is the people that have delayed phase of sleep disorder. Now, based on that, some people, as you see here, they have delayed the sleep phase, like teenager. They sleep at about 3 o'clock in the morning, all the way to 12 p.m. This is a lot of our aging population. They sleep early in the evening. They wake up until 3 o'clock in the morning. Normal sleep, which I don't know if it's normal. I just I put it normal, but I, I, we can debate on that. But then we're supposed to sleep like 9 p.m. and wake up like 8 o'clock in the morning, fresh, wise, healthy, and, and, and everything. But the people with dementia, these are the people they have dementia. They have a regular sleep cycle. And they actually go to sleep, wake up. Go wake up, sleep, wake up. Sleep, wake up. The biggest mistake that we do in the practice today, we give a sleep medication to people with dementia. Because we're fighting with the brain. I mean, their brain is like that. They're not going to have day and night. There's no way you can have a dementia patient and you ask them to sleep from 9 p.m. to 6 or 5 in the morning and wake up and say, ah, oh, I wake up. This is the wrong thing. And this is that when you look at the physiology, they can have a sporadic and, and, and sleep pattern. And giving the sleep medication between that is not going to help. It makes the brain to become more sedated. Now, new life of aging is true. We actually have a lot of things happen to our life that we've never happened before. If you look at the history of human, we, we're supposed to live in the cave and we, and we had an agricultural life, a gatherer, hunter, human, now we have a new life because of this gentleman, Thomas Edison. He actually invaded the darkness, but he made insomnia for us. Because what happened is that because of artificial light, our brain is not able to go very well Understanding, and now beside of that, electronic devices, computer, iPad, TV, all the things that we use, it makes our brain confused. I wanted to tell you, before I came to Stanford, I was the doctor in Central Valley, and I had majority of my patients have been farmer. 
I never, never had a farmer came to me and said, I need a sleeping aid. <laughs> never. And you know why? Because they go with the natural clock. They go in the evening time when it's dark, they go, they go inside, and they wake up whenever is actually going to be the time. Because of electronic life, or a sleep disorder is just getting worse and worse. It's just the lifestyle that the modern society brought for us. And okay, so getting great rhythm is so important. I need to be a little bit faster uh, before Dr. Alameda gave me some hard time. The body function, temperature, hormonal effect, I don't want to go on details on that. We have everything. It affects on, on diabetes, depression. It's true. A lot of things that happen in circadian brain rhythm, it causes a lot of bipolar disorder, seasonal affective disorder, many other things. We have a lot of experience. Like, for example, we know in mice, when they have a regular schedule, eat well and sleep well, they don't gain weight. But when, when, when they sleep any time that they want, um, they actually have the more obesity. This is, I don't, I don't want it to start that, but you know, you probably hear about shift of uh, uh, sleep disorder. For people that are working at night and sleeping during the day, they have a higher risk to get diabetes, obesity, weight gain, and many other problems. And this is a big, big union discussion. I don't want to go to politics like that. But definitely there is, there is a problem because you actually fight against of your natural brain. The sleep has effects on cardiovascular. Sleep uh, uh, insomnia causes elevation of the blood pressure, increased risk of a stroke, diabetes, obesity, as we know. I, I probably, you know, uh, years ago when we had a World Cup soccer, there was a Chinese gentleman that he didn't sleep for 40 hours, and it was on the game of between Brazil and Chile that he had a stroke. Because of his not, he was just following all the games through that. And when they actually found the autopsy, they said he had a stroke probably because of insomnia that he had. It's just so important to sleep, but increase the risk of cardiovascular. Uh, this gentleman, which is the uh, most well, famous guy in the world, has, and he actually has a very interesting thing. He was sleeping uh, 10 hours each night, and he gets a lot of nap. Actually, they said for Albert uh, and Einstein, they actually was sleeping around 12 hours to 13 hours a day. And it's very interesting because they think about uh, uh, a lot of things that he found through the physics is actually click on his brain during sleep time, which is true. Um, um, and um, they probably know Tesla. Tesla also had uh, the habits that he actually gets a lot of naps, which when, when you calculate that, he actually getting like 11 hours of naps. He's not able to sleep during the nighttime, but he's trying to compensate during the daytime. And that's why important, because I wanted to say why Randy had a short-term memory loss when he had uh, insomnia. I will tell you why. A sleep is the time of reconstruction of our memory. If you look at this area, I have it in my slide, uh, this area is a hypocampus area, which is the area of you get short-term memory. Whatever I tell you right now is not going to go to the deep side of your brain. Uh, and, uh, and everything goes to your hypocampal area. Now, if you sleep tonight and you wake up tomorrow morning, Sunday, and the breakfast is said, oh, the army said something about sleeping. Now you're able to remember that. <laughs> but if, if you don't sleep well, whatever I tell you today, you're not able to remember it next day because it's just going to be not processing properly because hypocampal area is exactly the area the people with short-term memory loss with dementia get affected. If I have an MRI of somebody with dementia or Alzheimer, this area gets actually very small. And this is because of hypocampal area affected. Now, what happened is during the sleep cycle, Everything we talked about with the rating and procedural memory, it goes to that area and it goes to the deeper sleep. What does it mean with that? We have different kind of memory. I don't want to go on detail on that. But we have some declarative memory, which is, again, it's easy to form and easy to forget. That's why I forget my anniversary sometimes. And my wife is also forget that. And we're, we're fine. We have, we have um, again, it's a common experience. And, but you can easily remember, you can easily forget. But this non, non declarative memory, you're still able to remember. This is, this is something that, for example, if you haven't ride a bicycle for 40 years, but if somebody gives you a bicycle after that, you're still able to handle that. Or you, you, if you're skiing during the long time, if you're getting older, you're still able to do that. Because that part of memory is that. But uh, for declarative memory and procedural memory, you definitely need that. This is why the advice we have for our students, if they haven't finished a chapter at night and they have exam tomorrow, 
they have an option to finish that chapter and then go to exam tomorrow if it is or sleep for two to three hours. We always recommend go sleep because if you sleep, you're able to code in all the information that you got earlier and forget about that chapter because there's not going to be any question on that. But, uh, <laughs> but if you look at here, during the daytime, you get all this information, you get all the information that I gave it to you right now, but this is your central brain, which is kind of like very, uh, again, hectic there, you sleep and you look at here. Everything's going to be very organized and it goes widely into the deep part of the brain. When you wake up in the morning, you have nothing in your hypocampal area, you're fresh, free to have your day and you're, you're going to be awake the next day and everything goes to your uh, deep side of the memory. Uh, it's a common experience from, uh, again, the famous guy, which I love him, um, that is a common experience that the problem difficult that a problem difficult at night is resolved in the morning after the economy of the sleep has worked on it. He was absolutely right. And it's, it's true because we have a lot of science showing that even the people they have a problem solving, they ask some people to be awake for a night and other people asleep. They found if other people are sleeping, they're able to solve the problem during sleep time. Just in the sleep time. Then how much is important for a sleep uh, time? Very good, Dr. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay. Maybe a, a, a couple minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Very good. Um, our immune system also is important for sleep. Just an experience. We know that people get flu vaccine and they don't sleep. They actually found in the study they have the um, less efficacy of the, of the flu vaccine. That's why it's important. Sleep is really the part. That's why when we get flu, they said go to the bed, hydrate, and sleep. It's true. There's no treatment. Because the sleep is the only thing that can help the immune system to recover the condition. Quickly about light therapy. Because of the brain circadian rhythm I described to you, light therapy is important. It's, I might want to give, just want to give you some time for that, uh, for questions. But light therapy will be either bright light therapy with sun, or you can use the light box, which you get some dose of the light during the day. It's, it was not common before in, in people living in California, more than like a Scandinavian country, they're actually using a lot of people in Washington state, they didn't have a sun and they actually use a light box. But because of our life right now, which is majority happening indoors, now we are getting toward the light therapy. There are a lot of evidence, I'm going to be quickly on that, you have some of this data in your paper, but definitely help with anxiety, depression, and many other people that they have dementia. Uh, there are some of the evidence, it's the best time for the light therapy will be uh, early morning for people that have delayed sleep, like for who? Teenagers, not for, for, for people that have advanced. But for people that have advanced, uh, a sleep disorder, like a lot of the aging population, they wake up early in the morning. Later afternoon is the best time to get the light. This is the reason that I advise to my patient when they complain about and say, don't go outside, because when you wake up in the morning, you have a tendency, especially in the aging population, to go outside for a walk. I, I advise them to put the strongest sunglass on your eyes in the morning. Don't get any lights till afternoon. When you go in the afternoon, remove the sunglasses, get the maximum light that you can. Because this way, you're able to adjust your melatonin and able to actually kind of like help you with, you with the problem that you have. Early morning walk with the sunglasses that I told you, late afternoon no, walk without sunglasses. Definitely has some effect on anxiety as well. In the many studies shows that it helps. There's some of the study also shows that uh, the people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, if they get the light, they actually really help them with that depression and aggressive behavior, something that is very important. Uh, light therapy, it's, it's important. It's, it's going to be very slow to be effective. Um, we can do it through the sun. We can do it through the light box. Um, the, the only things that I wanted to say, this is a slide that's probably too much you have the information, but I wanted to tell you that um, a lot of people are inviting me in for like memory care and say, oh, we have a lot of windows here. We have a lot of light. That light is not effective. If you're going to be only some distance from the window, you're never going to get the light. You definitely need to be outside. And that's why it really doesn't matter if you're going to be in the, in the, in the house with a lot of the windows on it. It definitely should be outside. This is answering your question that why do people don't sleep in their sick home hospital? 
that because they don't get the light exposure. With, the, with, the, with all the artificial light, beeping, noises, all other stuff, we are as a doctor, wake them up 6 o'clock in the morning, I'll come and check you up, or we just come and do blood tests on them 5 o'clock in the morning, they're never able to get their sleep. There are some of the effects on the sleep and the disease, but I don't want to go that, but a lot of diseases can interfere with the sleep cycle with cardiovascular, hypertension, Parkinson, respiratory chronic pain. One of them is actually going to be heart failure as well, which the people get shortness of breath during the night time. The only things about I want to have more details on your instruction about a people have a sleep obstructed apnea, and it's just the problem that they're not able to get oxygen very well during the night time. It's a very, very important thing, and it may cause Again, a lot of them, they can snore, they can end up on obesity, they, there's a relationship with memory loss and that, um, and again, a lot of them, they're not aware of the apnea, or a lot of them, they don't snore, and that's very important that, um, but they did morning headache, they did personality change, poor memory, confusion, they did late on the sleepiness, and this is, this is something that we always recommend to have a sleep consultation, and they may need to have a CPAP machine, which is a pain for a lot of my patients to use it anyway. But if you're able to, to get to use the CPAP machine, there's a lot of the um, benefit of using it. Um, and as far as medication, a lot of medication that we use is, is or we prescribe to actually make the people to become more sleepy, is I mean, more a sleep problem. Anything, blood pressure medication, um, it's, I see a lot of time in nursing home or the hospital, they bring nebulizer treatment for breathing treatment. And then one hour later, they call me and say, the patient says, I, don't, I can't sleep, can I get an ambulance? I said, well, you just give the device right now, it's a stimulant. How are you going to get the sleep medication to reverse it at that time? Diuretic, especially at that. Uh, we talk about uh, behavioral change during sleep. We quickly talk about um, restless leg syndrome. Some people have, I don't want to go into detail on that, because it's going to be too much periodic movement that people can have. Red behavioral sleep disorder, which I explained to you what happened to them at night time. Restless sex syndrome and periodic movement is really, really a big problem, increased by age. There are, the, the restless sex syndrome is really unpleasant. They feel like, especially at the beginning of the night, they need to kind of moving their legs, and um, they need to massage their legs as well. And it's, it's a lot of the, a very different experience in a lot of people, but definitely it's more difficult in the people with dementia, and um, it's sometimes causing them to be wandering as well. It's genetic, it's very important. Women is actually getting more. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing for dementia because they sometimes just wake up with the screaming and we really don't know why. They may have some uh, iron deficiency, but very interesting medication that we prescribe, it makes it worse. Which, uh, again, caffeine, antidepressant medication, a lot of antihistamine that we use. Now, I have in your, uh, again, instruction about improving the sleep hygiene. I don't want to go on that. You know about it. You, you can find it on the internet, which what you need to do as far as like a sleep, give it the time, relax mentally, don't just use your bed for a sleeping time. If you don't sleep, make sure you get out of bed and they go to the, to the, to the different room and, and sleep at that time. These are important things. But I just want to quickly about say about pharmacologic approach because I'm sure we're going to have a question. It may be some people they have in sleep disorder in the short term may be effective. I put it also in your instruction about all these details. You have all this information there. I just want to tell you about the adverse drug events that uh, that a lot of this sleep medication they have. I mean, it, there's all of them there are in the market from Ambien, Benzodiazepine, Melatonin, Trazodone, Mirtazepine. Um, even they are effective for the short term. The, the trials that we have about effectiveness, first of all, they're all industry sponsored. That's number one I want to tell you. The other things about the potential benefit of this sleep is when they are effective, but also we have to calculate and weight the risk of taking this medication. We have a lot of, lot of risk is going with, with using of this medication. And there are definitely um, um, something that we need to consider with that. A lot of this medication, like Ambien, which is a very famous one, which we recommend to using more than less than six months, because in the long term, uh, uh, using it, the increased risk of fall, increase, even there are some evidence showing in the long term use, they may increase risk of cancer in some people as well, because it's just an observational study, which I put in the instruction as well. I'm sure you guys are going to ask me about artificial melatonin supplement. It may work in some people. 
but you should be very lucky to have enzyme to metabolize this melatonin. Some people they don't have enzyme, it's not going to work. It's a very, very controversial about the effects of melatonin on, 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 on people. And what the only thing is that definitely physiology of the dose of the melatonin, it, it can help if you're able to absorb, if you're able to metabolize, and you can use it as your as your um, supplement, but in some people, they don't, they don't, it's not going to work and make them too more sleepy as well. Wrap up with sleep is not an illness. Sleep deprivation has, again, has definitely affects on our health. One thing that I wanted to tell you, there's no safe sleep aids available. There's nothing safe. They're all of them, they have a side effect. But one thing is so important for you to know is change the circadian brain rhythm. A lot of things related to your sleep is your lifestyle. And if we not correct or wipe this stuff, we're still going to be in the same pattern of the sleep disorder. And, um, and I'm trying to put it on your uh, part of the, the stuff that you, if you have more question on that. Um, again, the, the conclusion that I wanted to tell you that every individual is very different. We have different brain, different circadian brain of, of rhythm. And, but we, when we look at yourself and we actually look at your schedule, we can actually find many reasons that why your sleep pattern has been changed. And you can definitely help it for self as well. I just want to tell you that doctors can be a less helpful people in, 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 in treatment of this sleep disorder. But uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If I was able to make it to take a nap during my lecture, that means my lecture was successful. <laughs> Thank you. during the night time. 
and we're not able adequately have the efficiency that we are trying. And that's why, again, they're not able to clear the stuff in the brain. And during the daytime, they have the moments of the speed pressure beyond, I mean, just when and some of the people, they, they, they really kind of like him falling asleep. This, this, if, if it's really severe, we recommend to do a sleep study test to just see if there's any obstructivity happening in there. Yeah. Sometimes it's just a physiologic response. You may get bored or you watching the news or you just get bored and say, no, that's my That's the action. <laughs> uh, this, this way, I mean, we, we really... Do, uh, do you have any recommendations of books for the layman? I don't see you. Where are you? Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, recommendation of any books? Yeah. There are a lot of books. I, I, I can't point you any books, but there are... Um, um, I don't know about the books that it's... Uh, there are a lot of the resources are available. But, um, this this oh, one here? This, yeah. oh. this lady is great. Um, I have a history of sleeping very well. Fall asleep very well. I have unwisely chosen to have very few hours of sleep for many years. Uh, okay. So, question I'm trying to get back to okay. yes, a healthy sleeping pattern. Have I damaged my brain? <laughs> <laughs> and how long, if I can get a good schedule and have it? How long will I take it for my brain to If I able to answer your question, I will be next Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> uh, science. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if there's any damage. I, I get you are. How about, uh, how about a gut feel? Uh, <laughs> no, not really. I mean, it's, first of all, it, it's very hard to say. The number one is this, we're still on the beginning of finding many things on neuroscience. I, again, the things about I talked to you about the lymphatic system, all this, these are all new neuroscience. We ne never know that before. Why we need the sleeping to the lymphatic system to bring adenosine. A lot of things about sleep apnea, a lot of things that we talk about in melatonin, are all new in the neuroscience. We really don't know about that the people there, you haven't been sleeping very well, you already damaged, or for example, you have a problem with memory or cognitive impairment, all this stuff. We don't know. We really don't know. Um, but one thing I can say that you can you can change your schedule with me. It's going to be harder because uh, that, that's exactly something that you need to practice. And first of all, it's not going to happen in one day or one week. It's really going to be a pattern. But definitely with, with what we discuss about that time of exercise, getting right, have a regular sleep pattern. In, in evidence and a study and observational study shows it really works. You're able to come back again through the function. If anything else not happened to you that, that actually makes interfere with, with this situation. But uh, yeah, but you're okay, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> what is the uh, what is the effect of taking naps in the afternoon? Yes. And what is the medical what are the benefits of that? Yes. Good question. But now it's very interesting because um, siesta or, or afternoon nap, which is very uh, common in the traditional societies, um, majority of the study done about the benefit of the siesta has been done in the United States, where the place to go to sleep at the afternoon. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of benefits. Uh, first of all, as I told you about my Tesla pattern, the way he was asleep. He was not able to sleep at night. He was compensating during the daytime. Even if you sleep one hour during the daytime, you're able to do all this normal physiology things happen to your brain. It's just the sleep is important. Interestingly, um, a lot of people that were so interested, why the people in some of the area, like especially in Italy, Spain, uh, Okinawa, Japan, which we talked about two years ago here, why they actually live longer and healthier? Maybe the answer is actually going to be in the afternoon nap. They get really relaxing afternoon nap. Um, it's a lot of benefit of it. However, there is a debate. If you go see a sleep physiologist or a sleep psychologist, they say, well, if you want to sleep at night, you should not take a nap in the afternoon. Now, one advice that I have for all of you, which is, again, I have the same advice for my patient. You should not really care about the hours of your sleep, what time you sleep, what time you wake up. 
If you sleep, like, if you get a nap in the afternoon, and you sleep, like, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning, and you get another one or two hours in the afternoon, you just calculate how many hours you sleep during the day, five or six hours. That's great. That's fine. Now, who cares if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you say, okay, everybody's sleeping, that's fine. I got my five hours sleep at night, that's fine. That's why fighting in this situation, that was exactly the answer to that. Because a lot of my patients, they actually wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, they, they slept from 8 p.m., but they wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they're looking for a sleeping medication at 2 o'clock in the morning. When you take a sleeping medication, one thing that I just put it in your instruction, the effects I told you about in memory for sleep, if you take a sleep medication, you don't get that benefit because you sedate your brain and you're not able to empty your hippocampal area. Now, instead of that at night, if you take a nap and you're able to remove everything from hippocampal, your memory is going to be sharper if you're sleeping in the afternoon. And there, but there are a lot of good benefits of cardiovascular, a lot of good benefits of preventive stroke for people that take siesta. Yes, right. there are a lot of them. Yeah. Um. Uh, I think they're going to they kick me out of this place because I think that's the speaker's name. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. I've been using melatonin at 2 or 3 in the morning. Uh -huh. And 3, we know this. Um, is there any harm in long-term uh, use of melatonin in that way? Uh, it works. The, the, it works. It works for you? Yes. Okay, no. There's no harm if it works for you. And let, let me tell you one thing. If I um, uh, tell you that there's no side effect of melatonin or any other medication, I would be like, I mean, there's, there's, that's not. There, there, every single chemical has a side effect. Melatonin also can cause sedation. Melatonin, even natural melatonin. This is one of the big arguments we have in the population people, which I which we recommend. Don't give the melatonin. It doesn't work, and you make them more sedated. Um, this is why I told you, you have to find yourself what is your brain circadian rhythm is, is, is for you? What, what's the structure of your brain circadian rhythm? If you find yourself that I take my melatonin at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's not any effect, there's not going to be any damage. But if you tell me about the chemicals that you're using, it has a side effect, if it works for you, you haven't seen a side effect problem, you're done. That's answered to another question. Have I got a brain damage for the three years that I, I don't know? I don't know it about you as well. Maybe 20 years from today, uh, I will be retired. I don't know, I hope so. I, I might be retired now. But 20 years from today, now the speakers are going to come and say, there are any that show you that the supplement causing this, this complication. We don't know it. Right. But if it works for you, enjoy it. <laughs> do, you, do you have any advice for the new the effects of uh, jet lag? Jet lag. Yeah, that's the same thing. Uh, the, 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 when we talk about brain circadian rhythm, the jet lag is the same. You change your time zone, and uh, uh, there are some other strategies that people use. They're taking melatonin supplement, but the people being in a, uh, like a commercial pilot, I don't know if you anyone, if you, if you've done it in the past, but commercial pilots is a very interesting strategy. When they get to the next destination, they usually get in the sun therapy. They actually move their hat, they go sit someplace, and they're spending 15, like 30 minutes under the sun in a new place in order to regulate the brain to the day and night. There are, there are some of the strategies for the jet lag. Um, you can find on the internet. There's, like, for example, if you get to the next destination on the east side, make sure you wait to regulate your sleeping cycle, sun exposure on a new place. It takes like a day or maybe weeks for some people that gradually you come back to your your circadian rhythm like that. Now, taking the sleep medication, yes, it's an always rapid solution, but to be honest with you, again, we, we, we recommend not, unless if you're really exhausted and not sleeping, then you can sleep the medication. Dr. Oma Akbai is Director of the Service for Multicultural Dermatology and Hair Disorders at University of California, Davis. She has special interests 
in pigmentary disorders, disorders of the hair, and conditions unique to ethnic skin, thereby providing us the opportunity to view her expertise through a diversity lens. Now, the skin and aging stimulates intellectual and emotional interest and conflict with me. Because I see myself on every one of her slides. <laughs> so, without further ado, please give it up for Dr. Oma Akbar. Some of 
structural changes that result in that. But what about the chin? Does the chin appear longer? Show of hands. Or shorter? Show of hands over time. Okay, let's do that again. Who's for, who's for longer? And who's for shorter? Okay. The chin actually can appear shorter over time. And we'll go into why that is the case. So the changes of the face are not just a matter of things drooping or sagging, okay? There are structural changes of the face that can pull different aspects of the face in different directions and cause some changes over the years. The upper third of the face gets longer. We discussed that. The mid face can experience some volume loss, which is actually loss of fat. And that can cause the nose to become elongated because of a sinking in kind of effect of the mid face. And the lower third can get shorter because of fat redistribution and actually a resorption of bone over time. So what are the types or stages of aging or evolution. Well, there are multiple types. The first type is the earliest, of course. It's type one. This is seen in people who are in their 20s and 30s. Everyone in Hollywood seems to stay in this phase. <laughs> you see some mild pigmentary changes, maybe some sunspots or solar lenticos. You're not really seeing any wrinkles or the scientific name for that is right in. Type 2 is wrinkles in motion. So, rhinids or wrinkles don't appear unless the face is moving. So, here you can see what people generally call the crow's feet, which for this gentleman would disappear if he stopped smiling, which he should never do. And this is seen in the late 30s to the 40s. I couldn't find any more Hollywood people who were fitting these descriptions for some reason, so I had to use a textbook photo. So, type 3 is wrinkles at rest, which means that the wrinkles that appear during smiling, they still remain in place even with the rest of the face. And you can also see some other discolorations. Here you see some solar lentigos which are commonly called sunspots. And you can also see some vessels on the cheeks, on the forehead, on the nose, on the chin, and those are all a part of that normal part of aging. And you can see this in individuals in the 50s and beyond. And type four is referred to as only wrinkles. And you see the rhinids diffusely in areas of motion, as well as areas that don't have as much motion. So you can also see a yellow-gray discoloration of the face and some hyperpigmentation. The skin can assume a bit of a coarse texture. And you can see this in the 60s and 70s and beyond. So what causes wrinkles aside from wisdom? Well, Wrinkles, they come naturally over time. <clears throat> However, a certain level of aging can occur because of environmental factors, and that's more of a, a type of premature type of change. And so we'll go over some of that. There are underlying causes of wrinkles, and there are many of them. One of the most significant causes of premature aging is UV radiation. There's also loss of skin elasticity, which is something that's natural that happens over time. There is the repetitive movement of underlying facial musculature, and then, as we alluded to before, the changes in volume and fat redistribution. We'll go over that in a little bit more detail. So, how does smoking affect aging of the skin? Just wanted to like this little statement right here. Man, I could kill a human right now. <laughs> so smoking, you know, your primary care doctor will get on a soapbox 
house and tell you don't smoke for many reasons. One of the many reasons to quit smoking is because it can actually accelerate photo aging, make your skin more susceptible to aging from the sun. And that's not just because of the position of the mouth to smoke, it actually decreases your body's ability to clear what we call free radicals. And UV can induce free radicals in the skin, and if you're not able to clear them, then you can age prematurely. So, are there any smokers out there? That's my soapbox for anti-smoking. There was a study that showed that individuals who smoked more than 50 pack years were almost five times more likely to develop facial wrinkles than non-smokers. And when you have a combination of sun exposure as well as unprotected UV exposure, then those can work together to create a synergistic pattern of premature aging. So how exactly does the sun cause aging? So you have this gentleman here basking in the sun about the same color as me, even though he appears to be uh, European. And he thinks that the sun is his friend because it gives him this lovely brown glow, but the sun is not his friend. His friend. The sun can induce a lot of changes in the skin that can not only accelerate aging, but can induce skin cancers, and we'll go into that as well. One thing that I hear a lot when I ask patients about sun exposure is, oh, I don't go out in the sun very much. I, I never was a lifeguard, I didn't go tanning, I didn't, I wasn't a sun worshiper. But truly, it's the cumulative exposure over time that increases your risk for skin cancer. So this doesn't have to be in those who play outdoor sports, it could just be from driving. A lot of truck drivers will have skin cancers and multiple skin cancers on one side of the face. Can anybody guess which side of the face that is? <laughs> left side, yes, because you do get UV radiation through the window glass. So most window glass will filter, does anyone know which, which UV window glass, uh, most window glass will filter? It's UVA or UVB? Usually B is blocked and UVA can go through the window and both types of UV exposure can cause skin cancer even though UVA doesn't necessarily cause as many sunburns, it can cause some of those molecular changes in the cells that can induce skin cancers and induce reactive oxygen species or free radicals. So it's very important to avoid those little bits of exposure over time. That's why I say, you know what, keep a hat right by your door if you're gonna go get your mail or go take a walk and make sure you stay covered with a wide brim hat Keep a hat in your car so that when you go to the grocery store, you're putting on something to cover your skin when you're walking around the parking lot. Because even if you never were a sun worshiper, so to speak, all those little bits of sun exposure over time can add up to increase your risk, not necessarily for melanoma, which is the most aggressive type of skin cancer, but for non-melanoma skin cancer. So these are a listing of different clinical signs of photoaging, which is UV-induced premature aging, and they're listed here. You have wrinkles, the lentigos, discoloration, telangiectasias, loss of translucency, loss of elasticity, and kind of a salad of color. So on to the next topic, how does skin color affect aging? So aging is a global problem. People come to me saying, oh my gosh, I, I want to look 10 years younger. No matter what skin color, no matter what ethnicity, there is just a universal desire for people who desire that uh, to kind of turn back the clock. But I address different patients differently based on the amount of melanin they have in their skin. And they require different treatment and different counseling. So even though Caucasian skin is more prone to UV injury, um, while those of skin of color are not, they both can have UV injury and photo aging that can be very significant. So whereas in lighter skin types, you can see more of the 
the wrinkling, and some darker skin types, you can see more of the dispigmentation, hyperpigmentation, and discoloration. So how does the sun affect light skin compared to dark skin? So what is the natural sun protection factor? I see, I hear some papers rustling here. <laughs> cheating. What is the natural SPF of dark skin types? Is it A3? B13? C23? Or D33? partitioned 
into compartments, right? almost like little rooms in the face. And each of those compartments evolve over time. And a lot of people think of aging as kind of, you know, maybe you gain some weight on a couple pounds over the years, and maybe the fat is causing your face to droop. But there's actually a loss of fat in very key parts of the face that make it so that your skin is not supported and held up as it was in previous years. And that can lead to a variety of changes that are listed here, kind of fancy ways of saying the tear troughs can become more apparent, the malar crease is uh, kind of like a, the cheek, like the smile lines, the nasal labial fold, the pre-jowl sulcus, that just means that there's, there can develop like a kind of indentation towards the front of the mandible area of the chin, even fat around the eyebrows can go down over time and decrease, causing there to be a kind of a sunken in appearance of the forehead. So it's important to understand these changes because if they are something that you do want to have some type of cosmetic procedure for, you can understand why the doctor is saying, okay, well, why don't we talk about this procedure instead of just Botox or just a chemical peel because it's really the volume of the face that decreases over time. So this is an illustration of how the fat compartments of the face can change. So this is an illustration of a young lady. You can see large areas of fatty tissue that are filling up the majority of the face here by age 35. By age 45, you can already see that some of these areas are starting to decrease in volume. So there's a loss of fat tissue here in these areas. And you really do need fat to hold the skin taut on the face. So if you start to lose that, this skin that was held up here high on the cheeks might start to droop here along the chin. And you see that demonstrated even more by age 55 and beyond. This is another illustration of the same concept. Okay, so what are changes in cartilage and bone of the face? So do ears get longer?
artificially died or artificially younger. So that's something that I think is very important in terms of establishing the right expectations and making sure you're on the same page with whatever cosmetic doctor you're seeing. So this is just to summarize how I approach cosmetic procedures. I really ask, what is your goal? What bothers you the most? And sometimes someone might come in thinking they need one thing, but they might actually need something else. For example, if they say, okay, my smile lines, they bother me. Can I have Botox somewhere around, you know, on my cheeks? Botox on your cheeks, first of all, you don't usually do that. Um, but it's not something that will change smile lines. Smile lines are caused by a loss of volume, and really to repair that, you want to fill in volume in certain areas of the face. So it's very important to have that communication with the doctor to make sure that you're on the same page. Another thing that I have on this slide here is keeping the downtime um, in mind, some procedures are a little bit more invasive and you might need a week or two of work or uh, as downtime without any social engagement. So those are also factors to consider that are very important. So these are some cosmetic procedures. They can be divided into a few different categories or a few different targets. So if you want to look at skin damage, you're thinking resurfacing creating an opportunity for your skin to regenerate by removing a top layer of the skin. And there are different ways of doing that. So you have tretinoin or tazeratine, they're prescription creams. You also have chemical peels, and they range from superficial to deep. There's salicylic acid, which I usually use. There's also trichloracetic acid, which I use sometimes, and glycolic acid. Then there's laser resurfacing, which can be mild, like Fraxel laser or more invasive like CO2 laser and microdermabrasion. If your target is wrinkling, then your goal is to use a bunch of linotoxin or Botox to temporarily paralyze the muscles <laughs> to stop the movement that reinforces the wrinkling. It's temporary, it just works for a few months, but it can make a big difference. And if your concern is loss or shift of volume, then cosmetic fillers would give you the best outcome. Okay. So this is just to say that sometimes you need to combine different procedures in order to really give the best outcome. There's not just one procedure that would address all of those concerns. So on one end of the spectrum, you have the topicals that I mentioned to reverse some of those UV-induced changes of the skin at the superficial level. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have plastic surgery procedures, which are sometimes done under general anesthesia, which sometimes require a lot of downtime and a lot more preparation. So this is an example of a trichloracetic acid chemical peel. And I'll orient you here. So this is the before picture. This is a patient that has several precancerous areas here, and this is not just for cosmetic treatment, it can be used to treat precancers, and we'll talk more about what that is. And here, the patient is having the chemical peel solution applied directly to the skin with a cotton tip. And then here, you see a frosting reaction. Hopefully that is projecting pretty well, but the skin appears um, more whitened, and that's a frosting reaction, which indicates that the peel is in fact working. And then here a few days later, she doesn't look very happy. <laughs> Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Um, but a few days later, you have uh, the peeling reaction, and then you have some of the pink skin, which is raw and regenerating. And then a few months later, you can see that there is a generally refreshed appearance, and you do not see the precancers. This was taken from a textbook. One thing that I have as a gripe about before and after pictures is that they only put makeup on in the after picture. Uh, but trichloracetic acid can be very effective at treating not only the superficial changes like fine lines and wrinkles and discoloration, but also precancers. 
Okay, so this is a patient who received the tricarcetic acid peel and the CO2 laser. And there's general rejuvenation, most apparent underneath the eyes. You're not seeing the wrinkling as much here. So that was for cosmetic purposes. And this is a patient that received a resurfacing procedure, the CO2 laser. So it's pretty clear that a lot of the fine lines uh, around the lip area, on the cheeks, they're not as apparent here. Um, however, would you say that this patient looks younger than this patient? Yeah? yeah? Okay. <laughs> I guess she does. But one thing that was not addressed was um, the line here. This is completely normal. You don't want to have so much filler that you just kind of look like your face is out to here. Um, so she does look more refreshed, does look younger, and um, it has a pretty natural outcome, I would say. Okay, so this is before and after. Hyaluronic acid is a substance that's in cosmetic fillers. And it's also a substance that your body makes naturally. So it can be injected safely into the skin to regenerate volume in certain areas. It lasts about a year or so. And this is before here, kind of from the front, from the side, and after. And you can see that there is a gentle softening of the line there. Botox injections are used to stop muscle movement on the face, to minimize the appearance of wrinkles. This is just to demonstrate that there are a lot of different ways to use it, and a lot of different muscles that can be targeted. And this is a young man who is receiving a Botox injection here. Okay, moving on to the hair. So that's one huge part of my practice is addressing hair loss disorders and hair changes. So how does the hair age? Well, in the earlier years, hair is shinier, it's fuller, there's a lot of luster. With wisdom, <laughs> it can become a little bit less shiny, a little bit less luster. And you also have alopecia disorders. There's male and female alopecia. And they're pattern alopecias, and they're typically seen starting at the crown or at the vertex scalp. And some people might say, maybe my hair doesn't grow as quickly as it used to. This is female pattern alopecia. My job as a hair loss specialist is to identify any potential underlying medical conditions that could be associated with hair loss disorders. A lot of the times, there are no medical conditions that are associated with something that is genetic or just comes over time. So in this case, most of the time, there aren't necessarily underlying disorders, although sometimes certain nutritional deficiencies can make it worse. So I typically check vitamin D, and ferritin to measure how much iron the body is storing. Because even if you're already predisposed to have a hair thinning disorder, if you have low iron or low vitamin D, it can make those conditions worse. So this is to demonstrate the different stages of severity. In the first stage, you notice that there's a bit of a widening of the part, and you start to see more and more scalp. And there are treatments for hair loss. Um, specifically pattern alopecia, we'll get into that. So this is male pattern alopecia, and it also has its own uh, series of stages. Usually the first stage is the bitemporal recession, and then from there you start to see a little bit of the vertex, and then from there you see more and more of the vertex. And this is also treatable, but I would encourage anyone who finds this as something that's troubling, again, it's normal, it's a part of uh, the normal evolution process, but for anyone who desires treatment, it's very important to start seeking treatment more in this stage, because once you get to this stage, it's not something that can be medically treated successfully. And that's when you're talking about hair transplantation. So what are the treatments here? Well, you have minoxidil, which is Rogaine, Rogaine foam, 5%. And this is a, a question I get all the time. Well, Rogaine foam for men says women can't use it. And then if you go online and you look up minoxidil 5%, there's now a Rogaine for women that's exactly the same that they often charge you more for. So it's exactly the same medicine. And I recommend Rogaine 
but it can make a difference between excising a skin cancer and having to excise it on top of getting chemotherapy and radiation and lymph node dissections and things like that in the case of that. So very serious. So here's a question. Why am I more likely to get skin cancers in the later years than earlier? Doesn't the sun hurt everyone equally? Well, the truth is that as we become more evolved, our skin is not able to repair itself from UV-induced damage as well as it could in earlier years. So if you decided to take a sabbatical in Australia at the age of 55, you would have more lasting and severe UV changes and DNA damage and an increased risk of skin cancer compared to if you'd spent exactly the same amount of time in Australia or some other sunny place at the age of 25. These are examples of skin cancers here. Does anybody know what this is? Someone said a squamous cell? That is correct. That is a squamous cell carcinoma. And squamous cell carcinomas have a wide variety of presentations. They can be a very firm, crusty spot that develops a bump and becomes painful. They can also look like a crater, like this spot. This is what we would call a crateriform papule. And the key is that it continues to change over time. So you have a pink, round papule that seems to have a crater in the middle there. Anybody know what this is? Basal cell carcinoma, that's correct. And basal cell carcinomas also can pre present with a wider variety of morphologies or appearance. In some cases, you can see what we call a pearly telangiectatic papule. So it's shiny, you have little vessels in it, and it's kind of pearly and almost like it's translucent or see-through. This is a superficial basal cell carcinoma, which can be confused with a rash. And it can sometimes look scaly. Sometimes people think, oh, I thought it was eczema, or I thought it was a little bit of separate dermatitis. And the key is that it doesn't go away, it doesn't regress, and it continues to expand. So you have pink, what we call telangiectatic patches, and you can see some of the vessels in there. <coughs> And this is another basal cell. So this one is uh, a pink papule with rolled borders. So you can see these borders are kind of rolling here like a little hill, and it's almost like there's a crater in the middle. So that's also very classic for a basal cell carcinoma. And here you have a flesh-colored papule with rolled borders. So this one's a little bit more subtle. They don't all have to be pink. And sometimes they can be brown or black and even mimic melanomas. Does anybody know what this is? So these are all examples of melanoma. Here you have a melanoma on the lips, and you have a very widespread and 
and you can see it's a very wide band of discoloration there. These are the ABCs, DE of melanoma, and A stands for asymmetry, B, irregular borders, C, different colors, and we saw examples of all of these, D, large diameter. So one general rule is to think about a pencil eraser. If it's larger than a pencil eraser, then it's absolutely something that needs to be checked. And most importantly, E is evolving. It appears to be changing over time. So this is some general reminders about sun protection and sunscreen. Absolutely everyone should wear sunscreen to protect their skin, regardless of race, or skin color, or age. And it's important to use enough sunscreen to create a little bit of a film, kind of a greasy feel. Broad spectrum sunscreen means that it should be UVA and UVB covering. And pretty much all sunscreens these days are now broad spectrum. And we do recommend sunscreen at least SPF 30 and higher. I typically recommend water resistant sunscreen in the summertime. And the FDA is getting more and more strict about sunscreen labeling. So water resistance means that you should have protection to go in the pool or go for a jog without towel drying for at least 45 minutes. And if it says very water resistant, that means that it should last for 90 minutes. However, if you towel dry after 15 minutes, you should reapply the sunscreen. And even if it's water resistant or very water resistant, it should be reapplied every two hours. And here is a reminder to apply sunscreen 15 minutes before going outdoors. However, if you're outside and you didn't put it on 15 minutes before, you don't give up and say, oh, well, it's too late anyway, I would encourage you to go ahead and apply it when you're already outside. So this is a reminder to say that skin cancers can absolutely form on the lips. In fact, certain types of skin cancers are more aggressive on the lips. And so uh, a type of, um, like a lip balm, with at least SPF 15 would be recommended for anyone spending a lot of time outdoors. So there are some other skin conditions that are commonly seen in advanced age. One condition that I see all day is actinic purpura. And actinic purpura is a type of bruising condition that's caused by UV and also just nature-induced thinning of the skin over time that make the scaffolding that we talked about, the collagen and elastic fibers, delicate, so it's very easy to get bruising of the skin in those areas. And this is something that can be exacerbated if you're already on blood thinners, such as aspirin or Coumadin or Flavix. But even if you're not already on those types of blood thinners, this can absolutely happen over time with UV exposure and sometimes without significant UV exposure just as a part of the natural evolution process. Seborrheic keratosis. If I open a clinic just for seborrheic keratosis, I would never go home. This is very, very common. And how they look is you'll see these stuck-on, wart-like papules and plaques, and some of them can be rather large. They can kind of come together and make pretty large plaques. And these are often seen in families. If I talk to a patient, okay, these are called separate keratoses. They run in families. They're sign of wisdom, wink, wink. So they say, oh, great, my mom had them, thanks to her. And I'll say, well, they do run. So it absolutely can be genetic. And there are multiple cosmetic removal options. They can get severely irritated. They can be almost hanging off because it got knocked off with clothing. They can be treated for that reason if they're symptomatic. But otherwise, it's considered a cosmetic removal. So one thing I wanted to point out is that if you suddenly have hundreds of these, even though individually, they're not cancers, they're not pre-cancers, they're not malignants, but if you suddenly have hundreds of them, they could be a sign of an internal malignancy, even though they themselves are not cancerous. And the internal malignancy is usually along the GI tract. 
So it's very important to pay attention. So even though, okay, sure, they're fine, but if you wake up one day and you seem to be covered in them, you might need to be evaluated by a primary care doctor to have imaging to find out if there's an underlying GI cancer. Solar lenticles, we've seen these earlier in this presentation. Just a little bit more information about them. There are brown macules and patches that are usually on the face, also on the upper back, on the arms, and they kind of have this moth-eaten type of ill-defined border. They are UV-induced type of pigmentation. You can have a melanoma that is resembling a solar lenticle. So it could be a spot that was there a long time and seemed to blend in with a lot of these lenticles, and then one of them seemed to start getting darker and darker or changing. That could be a sign of a lentigo maligna, which is a type of melanoma. Actinic keratoses are pre-cancers, and they occur in areas that are sun-exposed, usually on the scalp of balding men, on the face, on the ears, on the hands, and they present as papules with a very gritty, distinct scale. So it's almost like there's mostly scale and then not much underneath them, almost like they're just kind of sitting there. So those are precancers. There is a chance that they can evolve into squamous cell carcinoma. And the risk isn't huge, it's 1%. So there's a 1% chance of progression to squamous cell carcinoma. So we do recommend treatment of them for medical purposes. The more you have, unfortunately, the higher your risk of getting a squamous cell carcinoma, especially if they're not being treated aggressively. These are some treatment options that are listed here, ranging from liquid nitrogen to topical creams, such as 5-4-Uracil, and a type of light therapy called photodynamic therapy. Cherry angiomas are very, very common. They are bright red papules that can occur anywhere from the scalp, to the face, to the trunk, to the extremities. They're not at all related to UV exposure. So they can also run in families. They don't become skin cancers. They're typically asymptomatic, and usually we don't treat them. However, if they seem to bleed a lot or get very irritated, they can be treated with medical purposes, for medical purposes. All right, so to summarize, aging of the skin can be normal and healthy, yes. It is multifactorial and it doesn't just involve drooping over time. Sun protection, avoidance, and the healthy lifestyle steps that we discussed are the key to aging in a healthy way. And for those who are interested in cosmetic procedures, a board-certified dermatologist or a plastic surgeon would be the best resources to explore those options. Right. Are there any questions? Older, are we more? 
more predisposed to psoriasis? Not necessarily. Called superoxide dismutase, 
And that can help to reverse reactive oxygen species that can cause aging. There is a line called Meaningful Beauty with Cindy Crawford that contains that particular antioxidant. Um, in terms of all the other ones, you have to look for the active ingredients. And you can do that working with your dermatologist or plastic surgeon. Okay, last question here before we wrap up. I had a question about activity purpura. Other than protecting your skin from clearly being damaged, is there anything you can do nutritionally or to minimize the risk of bruising? Well, it's very difficult outside of the UV protection, the prevention, but if you do already have that condition, arnica gel can help to speed up the resolution of those bruises in some people. So that's A-R-N-I-C-A, arnica gel. Thank you again to Dr. Alibaba.